last talk before we get to the panel discussion. Uh, Mehdi's going to talk about um, uh, the impact of CMS and other regulatory agencies on certain things. I think he's changed a little bit yeah. the overall topic, but it should be uh, intriguing here. Well, uh, Alec, you know, that was a fantastic uh, you know, presentation, and I'd like to add a fourth to that, and that is that we need to engage our policymakers and uh, we need to fight on behalf of our patients in Washington. And hopefully the, my next few slides kind of highlight that. I was going to talk about bundle payments and all those depressing stuff. And, you know, I, I had actually put some slides together and I said forget it. So I stayed up all night and I changed all of my slides. But uh, I'm still awake because the catecholamines means are kicking in. So uh, I said, you know what, let's talk about something that we can discuss and kind of engage each other. And this is, has to do with the recent potential changes that may happen to DCB reimbursement. And is this of something of significance? Is, there, is it important for us to engage? And I think this is really follows nicely Alex's presentation, which I had no idea that it was going to take that, that approach. So, you know, in 2015, in February of 2015, DCBs became commercially available. In the April of that year, hospital outpatient add-on payment, what we call the transition pass-through, a uh, transitional pass-through, that's what TPT stands for, for DCP were effective. And I will explain to you guys what that means, TPT. How many people here know what TPT means and what is it all about? Right, so only a few people, very few people, and that's exactly what I mean, that if we don't know these things, how can we fight it for our patients? Because this is going to directly impact our patients uh, unless uh, we are willing to do procedures without getting paid. Uh, then in October 2015, hospital inpatient add-on payment was added. So April for outpatient, October for... Uh, so what is TPT? So CMS has this uh, program that is called uh, Transitional Pass-Through Payment. So this is exactly from the website. I pulled it out. It says to facilitate access for beneficiaries to the advantages of new and truly innovative devices by allowing for adequate payment um, for these new devices while the necessary cost data is collected to incorporate the cost of these devices into the procedure APC rate. So DCB comes is something new. It's similar to angioplasty. Do they reimburse you only for angioplasty? Or do they have to come up with a newer cost model for DCB given that it costs more to make a DCB, obviously, than to just make a regular balloon? So they use this period, they create a period where they give you additional you know, reimbursement, uh, additional reimbursement for using this technology while they're capturing data to try to understand whether they need to reimburse more for that particular technology. And if it's not clear, please raise your hand because this is informal, we're trying to learn. You know, I'm, I'm not an expert in this by no means and I'm sure there are other people that know much more about this than I do. So in July of 2017, uh, uh, turns out that there was an outpatient proposal uh, rule, meaning that the CMS said, okay, we have enough data now, now we can make a decision in regards to what we want to do with those APCs, how we want to reimburse this. And the decision was basically that the TPT will expire and DCB will be reimbursed under the current angioplasty APC. So many of you may not be aware, but currently when you use a DCB in an outpatient setting, or in the inpatient setting within the hospital. I'm not talking about OBL. I'm talking about in the hospital, patient as an outpatient, or patient is an inpatient in the hospital and you use it, you get this extra payment. So basically, you're almost getting the DCB for free because uh, of this pass-through payment. That's going to go away. And now you're going to get paid the same as if you were using a balloon, regular balloon for your patients, and, but you're paying the companies the price for a DCB. So this becomes significantly important, as you can imagine, especially as we are utilization of DCB is going higher. We are treating more complex lesions, sometimes in two, three of these devices in the, in the leg. And then under the new code, basically, now we go back to the previous reimbursement rate, which are these. So basically, if you do a firm pop and you use two to three DCBs, your reimbursement will now go back to what would, it would be if you were using just regular balloon angioplasty. Uh, and the rest is not that relevant to this presentation. So uh, what's the, uh, what's, why is this important and why am I raising this? This is important because really every one of us in this room can actually impact that. It doesn't have to be a physician. 
It could be industry, it could be a patient, it could be a scientist, because the, the uh, CMS does allow the population to comment and impact their decision. Now, I don't know how much, Skyler knows a lot more about this, and maybe he can educate us uh, as to how much impact he has, but uh, it's been reported that he does have some impact, and I'd be interested in your take on this. But you can comment now if you want, you know, do you think? Uh, well, I, I think the main issue is to get to the bottom of why they think that uh, they should make this change. Is it because they think that DCB is being used too much with too little data? I don't think they actually think that. I think they're lumping everything in. Now, they're really smart people at CMS, but, um, uh, you know, trying to figure out why they're making this change, um, is it just for simplification of billing and other things? Or is it because they think that people are using it in a way that they shouldn't use it? I don't, I don't get the sense that that's the case. Right. And, uh, and the data, I mean, the data is p relatively strong. I mean, I agree with Alec that, yes, we need to advance the data, and we need to know head-to-head. -head, we, we need to have head-to-head -head DCB trials and DCB versus DES and all those things and DCB plus atherectomy, yes. But right now, at the current time, uh, present time, uh, given that we have, you know, three devices, multiple randomized trials, multiple registries, I feel like we have enough data. So in any case, in any case, there is a 60-day commenting period where everyone, including all of us in this room, can actually go to the website and make a comment. So what should be done? So obviously, we talked about this. I mean, we have, I mean, I don't need to repeat this again, but basically this slide says that we have enough data showing that DCV is superior to angioplasty alone. And I think I don't think there are too many people that would argue against that. Do you agree? I don't know, Alec, yeah, what do you? I would, argue, sorry, no. I would argue that you have more data for this than you do for a lot of the stuff that we do, atherectomy, some of the stints uh, that we use. And, and so again, pushing, we should do this from societies, whether it's vascular surgery, we're on the Sky Committee, we've been right. discussing ACC, AHA, other things. So we have to be advocates for our patients, and this is a, this is a small um, blip on their radar, but it's really important. And, and again, to bring it to the, I think your point was wonderful, uh, uh, Skyler, because you know, he really highlights it here. Here we are, you get paid $15,000, $16,000 if you use atherectomy plus a stent, where there is really no randomized data, and yet with the technology that there are three separate, uh, phase three large randomized trial, we are questioning whether we should pay for it or not. Uh, and again, I'm not an expert in this. And this is basically showing that if you compare DCB, you know, to other technologies, you see that, you know, that the, actually their patency, the TLR rate is lower than even uh, uh, drug loading stents based on the pool data from this study. So what can, be, what can we do? I think that I wanted to raise this, and it's just wonderful that Alec took that approach, that, you know, we need to be engaged. I think CMS is currently seeking public comments. So I think each of you can reach to CMS and I have put the, web, uh, the, the website here, it's www.regulations.gov, www.regulations.gov, and then you put in there CMS-1678-P in the, in the, where I've shown you, and then you can then work from there and write your comments, write your experience. If you had, if you had DCB, write your own experience. If you have done it to others as a physician, write about your patients because I think all of these are important and we all should have, make an impact. Um, and I wanted to highlight really Skyler's work here and uh, I did this last night, honestly, I didn't even have the intention of, uh, I was gonna just take a different approach and talk about bundle payments, but his work which was published I think last week or a couple of weeks ago, really highlights this. And he looked at, he divided uh, the utilization of various uh, the devices and looked at the, not devices, but outcomes of patients in the various settings, and he can probably speak to this better than I can. But basically, first he showed that amongst this population of patients with 219, uh, over 219,000 patients, 38% uh, of the procedures were done in the inpatient setting, 53% uh, of the procedures were done in the outpatient setting, and about 8% were done in office-based setting. But I think what was interesting to me was this, and I'd be very interested to take, and I knew you're gonna be the, the chair of the session. Uh, it's interesting because if you look at this, the inpatients had the highest mortality. So then your first impression is that, well, the, the inpatients are the sick people, but that makes sense. They are sick, that's why they are inpatient, and that's why they have the higher mortality. But then you look at the next graph, 
and you are dumbfounded. So if they are the sickest people, then how is it that when it comes to revascularization rate and a cumulative incidence of, a, this is a, I think, a, a revascularization, that repeat revascularization, that the, actually the office-based patients had the highest compared to the inpatient and the outpatient. I just cannot put that data and explain that because the sickest people that are dying are actually are the ones that are not the ones that have the highest rate of need for revascularization. And I leave this for discussion at this point. Thank you very much.